Hello everybody, I'm Peter Day, a fairly long-standing stationer, but not half as long as the new master of the stationer's company, Stephen Platten. And he's here to tell us a little bit more about who he actually is and what he's doing. Stephen, from Berwick-upon-Tweed, your career in a nutshell, please. Well, um, I suppose I'd start off with um, school because that's why I'm a stationer. I was um, at Stationers Company School, which sadly closed some years ago now. Um, so you could say I've been a stationer for some 60 years. Um, that sounds like a record, except for people who've come in by patrimony, I imagine. But why, that's quite uh, why were you at the school? Well, I was at the school because my parents didn't believe in what would I would call it term um, um, scholastic democracy. In other words, they chose where I was going. They did. They put two or three ideas in front of me, and I said which one I thought. And uh, they then said, "Right, well, that's the one we're going to." But I was never um, sorry that I went there. I really enjoyed my time there. People seem to have an enormous affection for it. Yes, and I think one of the things that made it so good was the station's connection because uh, it had there was a certain sort of. Um, it, it wasn't just like any other school, you know, it, it, we, we would have um, once a year, there'd be the sort of um, prize giving, which happened in Hornsey Town Hall, and um, the courts would all come down. Uh, slightly foolishly, I think they were given a sherry party beforehand, and in those, those days, they were fairly um, uh, venerable. So some of them found the way down the aisle a bit more tricky than others. Anyway, after school, you did what? After school, I, um, I well, first of all, I went, I wanted to be, be a geologist, um, but I, I made a bit of fair old muck up, muck up of my, at the end of my school career. So um, um, I thought, well, the best way into this is to go to an oil company because they, they need geologists. But what, of course, what I had foolishly forgotten was that what they really wanted was people who had already been trained as geologists. So I went to work for Shell for, um, for some three years at um, Shell Centre, right next to um, Waterloo Station, that great tall building as it was then. And then? You and then, well, then halfway through that sort of period, I mean, I didn't know it was halfway through, but I, I think I decided that, although I made some good friends there, well, at least one of whom I've still kept up with, um, I, I didn't want to do it for the rest of my life. So I didn't be just pen pushing. So um, I thought, well, it's either teaching or possibly ordination. But I thought, no, I'm, uh, I'm too young. I'm not mature enough to make the second decision. So I went to train as a teacher. And eventually I came out with a, a degree uh, to teach natural science. Um, and then halfway through that, I thought, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to offer myself for ordination and see if they'll have me. And so, I just finished teaching and went straight off to theological college. And after that, you had a very interesting um, clerical career, so to speak. And I, still yes, does. I have had. Yes, I have had. Yes, I have. I've been very lucky indeed. People often say to me, "Now, of all the things you've done, which did you like most?" And I find it extremely hard to actually um, uh, decide on that one because I was a curate in Oxford. And that was a very good place to be a curate. Interesting things went on. And one of the sort of highlights was towards the end of my time, I organized a sort of way of the cross, which meant you acted out the passion through the streets at night. So we had floodlights and uh, stage lights and all the rest of it. And um, my great memory was my wife telling me that the policeman had said to her, I'll tell you this, uh, Mrs. He said, there's more people out here tonight than there are Oxford United on Saturdays. <laughs> Mind you, that wasn't saying a lot because the attendance was a bit poor, I think, in those days. But, but it was a good example of uh, what became organisational skills, which you've used all over the place, haven't you? That's true. That is true, yes. And um, uh, I suppose, yes, um, someone once said to me that I was clearly sort of a bit of an entrepreneur because I have organised other things. We had a great pilgrimage which went all the way from Rome and eventually um, across to uh, Derry in Ireland. Um, and then on other occasions I've organized similar sorts of things so um, yeah and I quite enjoy doing it we had I think we had 
in the way of the cross, we had 300 people altogether. And at the end of the day, I couldn't tell you which church they came from. It was a wonderful example of why um, it's best to actually do things together when you can't do them on your own. And then leaping ahead to Norwich, you did quite a big uh, building program in, Nor Nor uh, in Norwich Cathedral, which sort of um, has some bearing on um, what you're going to be doing in your in your year as master at the stationers company. It, um, indeed, I went to I went to Norwich having said yes to the job. Um, and this was uh, as I dean of Norwich Cathedral. As dean of Norwich, yes, and swallowed the um, the bait completely. Um, and then after about a month, someone took me around and said, I need to show you uh, some sites where we thought we might do some buildings. So I said, oh, that sounds very interesting. He said, yes, he said, you know that the cathedral is, you know, very good at making making ends meet. So I said, well, I gathered that. That's one of the things that rather, rather reassured me. Of course, he said, it won't be the case in this. We would have to raise the money. So I said, oh, well, what will that be? Well, it'll be a couple of million. So I sort of slightly gulped. But when I tell you um, something like seven years later, we've got up to the target being 13 million. Um, and anyway, it's now there for all to see, and it's very cheering. That and, and it's a remarkable insertion into a, a medieval cloister of the, the missing bit, isn't it? Indeed. And I think we, we were clear, we, we, we have one of these competitions for, um, with five architects taking part. And we were clear that the one thing it could not be was pastiche, because, um, you know, you were putting this thing alongside one of the great Romanesque buildings of England. And I suppose there's a parallel there, too, uh, with the stationers um, at the moment, because the building that, uh, on the outside anyway, that, that changes, will be unashamedly modern. Uh, and then you went on to be a bishop after Norwich. Indeed, yes. Um, and uh, they're really quite different um, roles in a way, because one of the things about a cathedral is you're part of a, um, a community. You live right next to the building. It's wonderful to wake up in the morning and hear the slightly out of tune uh, sound of the bells when they sound at each hour and looking at the spire and so on. And you also had a, a, a large number of people who um, were part of your community, not only the congregation, but people who were flower arrangers, guides, and so on. Whereas when you're a bishop, you're rather more remote because you live, we live sort of three miles from where the cathedral was and so on. And um, um, in a way, everyone wants you because they want you to come and do things. But on another level, uh, well, he's a bishop, so, you know, doesn't really come into our life most of the time, sort of thing. So I think, again, there's a good parallel between the Norwich experience and stationers, because, again, there is a community. That's, indeed, that's at the heart of the whole thing. Well, that takes us to where we are actually are now, because here we are in an intensely social organisation with social distancing in force for well, the foreseeable future, we could just can't tell. Terribly difficult job you've suddenly been um, um, vaulted into, isn't it? Or, well, slowly been vaulted slowly. into. <laughs> yes, I wouldn't, I, I, if it was going to happen, I wasn't expecting it to happen quite this way. Uh, as indeed, I'm sure um, my predecessor Trevor would say about the end of his time. Um, but one of the remarkable things is that we have actually all kept in touch with each other. Um, and there are some things we've learned from it. I think we've learned, for example, that we don't always need to come together for every meeting. Um, and that makes things a lot simpler. It also saves money in certain um, areas, as it were. But I'm also clear that we do need to get together again as soon as the possibilities arise. And even if it means that at the beginning it's in slightly smaller groups than we'd have hoped, I think it is really important that we get a balance there. But for a lot of people, a lot of stationers, the hall is absolutely at the centre of the experience. And you can have meetings on Zoom and you can have this sort of conversation on Zoom, but you can't get anywhere near the experience. Seeing at the um, uh, 
the, the master ceremony, a common hall, glimpses of the, the actual hall on Zoom was intensely moving. Yeah. They realize what we are missing every day or every week, doesn't it? Absolutely. And I mean, again, that's a parallel with, with working in a cathedral because uh, I, I can remember sitting in Norwich Cathedral one, one evening when we had someone talking to us about the roof bosses, which are it's one of the most remarkable collections anywhere in the world. You have a mirror and, uh, that you can view them, uh, a mirror on wheels that you can that's right. up you and down do all the, that. the main aisle and see. Yeah, and I sat there, it was a, a November evening, so the only light was coming from the floodlights outside. It was very evocative. And I was almost in tears thinking, goodness me, how have I ever ended up being given the responsibility to look after this amazing building for what it turned out to be eight years? And I think the same thing is true of Stationers Hall. We're very, very fortunate in having uh, one of the best of the halls and one of the oldest surviving halls in the city. And right near to St Paul's Cathedral, I mean, it really is an amazing gift. What do you want to do in your year as master? Well, there are many things. I, I, there, there are some things that, uh, that Trevor um, has begun, which I would very much not want to lose. His concern to try and make sure that we broaden the sort of diversity of people who are members of the company um, in, every, in every way. So I wouldn't want that to be lost. But I suppose the two things that really are absolutely in the forefront are, first of all, education. Because after all, that's how I ended up being a stationer. And um, as I said, I loved the school and we loved it being part of the stationer's company. We, and I can remember still having uh, various sort of plays and uh, pageants put on about one was called Cakes and Ale rather picking up the point of the service we still have once a year in St Paul's. Another was called The Master of the Company, and that was introducing people to the history. So education is at the forefront, I think, and we are now so pleased that we have an academy, which we are supporting in um, a, a part of London, which is quite mixed in terms of its opportunities. So we, I think we are contributing something really important there again with diversity and then also um, Helen Esmond's work with apprentices. I can't think of anything more crucial at this time when we're going to have to get used to a rather different world and the Shine Awards and so on. All of those things I want to put my heart and soul into. And we, and can, other do, thing, we can go on doing that in, in this uh, dislocated world, can we? We can, I think. a year to do this, and a lot of this year is, is obviously going to be very, very uncertain. It is. It is. And I mean, uh, I think that, that means the mere fact that it is uncertain, there's no point in sort of projecting where, what might happen when. But I think what we've got to do is to grasp every opportunity when it presents itself. And then, of course, the other thing is the development of the ball itself. And it happens that I was the chair of the, what in those days was called the Hall and Heritage Committee, when the idea of developing the hall was first brought back into focus. It had been around some 10 or more years before. Um, so I, I'm particularly enthusiastic that the idea that came from our committee and the energy that came from the committee all those years ago, now it must be seven or eight years ago, is moving towards reality. Um, and that's going to be a real challenge for us because we've got to make sure we have the financial wherewithal, the um, resources to do that. Um, but we've also got to have the imagination to make sure we get it right. And a huge amount of work has already gone into that. And of course, the hall is going to be closed. First of all, for <laughs> yes. the plague and then for the carrying out of Vision 350. So yeah. you are, yeah, you're in Berwick upon Tweed at the moment in your retirement house. Um, yes. Uh, you're going to be a bit remote from um, the hall as it conventionally is conceived. Well, yes, but when I was first on the on the court, um, I, um, which is about six or seven years, well, perhaps longer ago now, perhaps eight years ago, 
I was actually Bishop of Wakefield. So whenever court meetings happened, and I think I hardly ever missed one, um, then I would have to come down from Wakefield on the train. And one of the things we are blessed with here is an extremely good train service. I could be in London in three and a half hours. I love trains. So it's a real bit of a sort of, um, you know, I'm enjoying myself while I'm also doing work. Um, and I intend to be down in London as much as I need to be down in London. And one of the great merits is that there is a small flat. So that does mean that I've got a base there when I, I get down. So I think the other, the other thing is, of course, we shall still be having meetings um, and gatherings and dinners in exciting places. We shall be the guests of other halls, of other companies, in the way that other companies are often our guests. And I very much hope that we can use St. Martin within Ludgate because that's right next to the hall and gives at least a sense that we're not very far away. We're not very far away. Last question. What's a livery company for in the 21st century? It's not as clear as it was 500 years ago, is it? It isn't. Although, actually, in the case of the stationers, there is some clarity still, because these companies, of course, all evolved from being um, a group of people, a guild, um, that worked with, with those in a particular industry. So the Coopers made barrels and the um, Fletchers made arrows and so on. And we were there concerned with books and publishing. And our company, rather unusually, is very focused on its industries, which is really excellent. But we do still do marvellous work with those industries. And we've allowed ourselves to move with the times so that things like um, the digital world have become part of it. Um, so we, in some ways, we've stuck with that, but we've, we've kept um, metamorphosing ourselves into a new sort of uh, thing. But at the same time, it's there, to, um, it's there to do good work, hence sponsoring an academy, hence looking at all those other sorts of education. And it's also there, I think, to remind us of some of the great traditions of our country and of the City of London. And that's why the Hall is such a marvellous sort of icon of all that. And of course, you were a bit of a publisher too, weren't you? Hymns Ancient and Modern. Indeed, yes. I, I've done quite you, a bit of writing. You were part of the, uh, of, the, of the church empire. Exactly. And I, uh, one of the rather nice things is, although I came in as an old stationer, I had a perfectly good sort of a pedigree to have come in as a someone from the industry. I chaired Hymns Ancient and Modern, which is a medium-sized publisher. I think sort of about eight or nine million turnover a year with a number of uh, imprints for some um, eight or nine years and was on their board for longer than that. So yes, and, and I also, I can still, I'm just thinking this morning, when I was a young lad, my father was, the advertising manager for Van Heusen and Airtex, the textile firm. And so I was brought up in the whole world of printing and advertising, to some extent journalism. You know, we have things like the old fashioned blocks with, um, you know, the metal and wood thing. In my desk, I had one of those. And, uh, you know, my father would talk about the three colour printing and so on. So I, I've been brought up with it, really. Well, you live in uncertain times. Very best wishes, uh, uh, Newmaster uh, Bishop Stephen. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Peter.